Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 1120th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, Director of Programs at the Rail, and I have the pleasure of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Danny Moynihan and Jason Rosenfeld. And now I'll introduce Danny and Jason. Danny Moynihan is an artist, writer, and curator. Educated at the Slade School of Art, he was part of the Young British Artists Movement. Moynihan relocated to New York in 2016. Recent curatorial projects include Lindsay Adario, war photographer, on view now at Lyles and King in New York, and his current solo exhibition in praise of limestone, the subject of today's conversation, is on view at Natalie Carr Gallery. And our host today, distinguished chair and professor of art history at Marymount Manhattan College, Dr. Jason Rosenfeld, has curated the exhibitions John Everett Millay, Pre-Raphaelites, Victorian Avant-Garde, and River Crossings. He is co-author of the monograph Cecily Brown, and his book on Shazia Sikander will be published in May 2025 by Lund Humphreys. We're lucky to have Jason as an editor-at-large for the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jason to get us started. Thank you so much, Chloe. Great to be back here. It's been exactly 370 days since my last NSE. Um, I was feeling the pull and from from heaven descended Danny's amazing show um, at Natalie Carg, which we're going to talk about today. But I want to thank Chloe and the whole rail team. I um, also want to thank at the gallery, uh, Natalie, who is on maneuvers somewhere in Europe, uh, Isabella Dighton and Emma Jones, who are helpful in putting all of this um, together. Um, I want to thank Danny for agreeing to um, to do this. Uh, virtually with us and to talk about his work and his his history and uh welcome back ge i just want to say obviously yanks in seven no problem no problem uh we get rid of the sports metaphors this is the 1120th uh nse which is remarkable i couldn't find anything about that date except the battle of katanda which i never heard of before uh but we are in the present and talking with danny danny welcome thank you yeah, welcome. It's, it's great to have you here yeah. today. I'm going to launch right into yeah. the presentation. Yep. And we'll see how it looks. Good. No. All right. So there's uh, the requisite info. Uh, you can follow Danny on uh, Danny Moynihan 10. I, there's nine other Danny Moynihans that got in Instagram before you. Um, Danny Moynihan 10 there, unless there's some uh, celestial meaning while you chose the word. The well, it's a large uh, train station named after me. So Yeah, I know. But there's so many Danny Moynihan. True. Well, you served in the New York Senate for the, the, the Senate in uh, long Washington time. for long. long. Appreciate it. I did quite well. Yeah. yeah. Um, as I mentioned, there is an exhibition of Danny's uh, work from the last couple of years. It's titled In Praise of Limestone, which we will get to. It's at Natalie Carg's gallery in um, uh, downtown, Lower East Side, Little Italy. I'm not sure what actual neighborhood it is, but 127 Elizabeth Street, where you can find it on two levels. Uh, this is the website. Here's some views of the uh, opening there at the left, the view down at the first level from uh, above. And then here is um, the a view of the first floor uh, with the exhibition. We'll talk about some of these paintings. You'll see their uh, landscapes of a kind and either landscape format or portrait format. There's a couple like that. Um, and then uh, upstairs in the uh, loftier barn-like space above, um, there are a couple uh, five other pictures, including one on the stairway landing. Um, you see two views here of these uh, paintings, which um, ha all have a kind of similar tone and color scheme, but each is intricate and very different. Why don't you read this to start us off, Danny, and the, the conclusion, which we'll come back to this poem at the end. Um, the blessed will not care what angle they are regarded from, having nothing to hide. Dear, I know nothing of either, but when I try to imagine a faultless love or the life to come, what I hear is the murmur of underground streams. What I see is the limestone landscape. So Auden's in praise of limestone from May of 1948. So maybe use that as a, before we go back in time, talk a little bit about the inception of these works. And then we'll go and look at works by uh, your father and, and the rocks 
and the caves, but maybe just use this to begin with. Quarry 2021-22, one of the earlier works in the exhibition. Well, I think maybe it's important to, to start that um, I, I do begin with um, a Cezanne landscape. And the reason for that is that I was actually brought up very near um, where Cezanne painted almost on the uh, footsteps of the Mont Saint Victoire. And so it's a it's a landscape that kind of is very familiar to me. And it's also a, a landscape that exists now. So it's real. It, uh, and so um, um, uh, I took I took um, all of all these paintings of uh, Cezanne landscapes. And um, I take this as a basis, a kind of structural basis. For me, it's very important to have a kind of anchor to the paintings. And so I sort of draw it out and I see it. And then um, something comes of it, but I never know um, what will happen. Um, I just begin painting and uh, and um, this thing emerges. And quite often in a kind of, I suppose, almost kind of Jungian way, um, these sort of animal forms appear, mythical animal forms. Um, so here there's a kind of cerebrus type of um, uh, dog guarding the cave. Actually, it's not guarding, guarding people, you know, guarding um, Hades so that people don't come out rather than going in. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then you have these rocks, which are also skin. Um, uh, kind of female forms, maybe uh, almost sensual, maybe almost sexual, and then a kind of sort of layer of um, skulls and bones and uh, a kind of almost like a roaring tiger there in the background. And, um, you know, I, I, I don't really sort of read you know, I'm not saying to myself, well, I'm going to do this in this particular way, meaning this particular thing. So, um, but somehow or rather, it it, um, it kind of makes sense. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's where that came from. This, as I said, it's the first one of this particular series, uh, that and Gaia, uh, the two ones that... Um, I painted uh, first, and uh, both both have kind of Greek mythological um, basis. Um, and we'll look at that in a little bit, and we'll also look yeah. at on in comparison. And the idea of limestone via the poem, and also via the environs, which you know well in England and also in southern France. And limestone, if people don't know, is a sedim sedim sedimentary rock which is actually composed of billions and billions of tiny, fo tiny fossils, sea creatures, shell fragments, um, which have been pulverized and pushed together through time and pressure. Mm -hmm. And of course, reflect the previous ocean floor that was in these regions. So in fact, limestone itself, which if it's subjected to more pressure becomes marble eventually, um, limestone itself is composed of organic material and bodies in a way. So we'll talk a little bit about that as we go. I just want to give a little bit of uh, background for people who may not know that much about you and your life and your career. Your father was an artist. Um, here's the work, uh, which is the diploma work, I think, at the RA. Right. Yes, I don't really know that one, but uh, <laughs> yes. It was one uh, of the few landscapes I could find. Particularly gloomy landscape. Mm. But, uh... <laughs> you know, academicians did that all the time. They always sort of said... Yeah submitted a work which they were not going to be able to sell or did not want to sell necessarily. Yeah. And sometimes, uh, like Constable, it was rejected and they asked for something else. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not sure exactly what date that is, but... Um, it says 1939. Uh, the grind. Uh, very early, yeah. yeah. Very early. Just just before he became a, an official war artist. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, a little bit before and that. And, as, and that was his last show at David Noland. What you yeah. see, these still live paintings. Yeah, so this was a beautiful show from 2022 of Rodrigo Moynihan's uh, studio paintings. Um, there's this uh, gallery view, David Nolan's gallery up on the Upper East Side. Um, shout out to David and Valentina. And you mm -hmm. see some of the Tondo works that uh, your father did, which are extraordinary. Um, and then uh, there were a number of self-portraits um, in that exhibition, which have a kind of rigor uh, and formal qualities, which sort of connect him with modernism. But... Uh, so much of his work is based in a kind of thinking about the past 
and thinking about, you know, the live life through the lens of history, which I think is so inherent in, in what you've been doing. Yeah. So uh, some of this, the work that we're seeing today from the show seems to come out of your studies or finished works here. Two examples on the left of rocks, which are from around 2003 to 2015. And I thought I'd throw in another rock painting. This is John Ruskin's beautiful yeah. watercolor, um, which is at the Harvard Art Museums. Uh, you will see a couple pre-Raphaelite style works today. That's my M. Um, but, but, you know, maybe talk a little bit about the rocks and then we'll look at the caves and then we'll jump into the new work. Right. Well, um, I'm glad you've got that painting in the Ruskins because that, that and, 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 uh, the kind of plein air paintings of the early 19th century were very much in my mind, um, as, uh, as a kind of very sort of one-to-one -one type you know, just ob observational paintings that I was very particularly interested in and love. Um, the the rocks actually came about because uh, there was a point I was painting throughout the 80s and 90s and having shows and things in London. And there was a point when I said to myself that um, I, I, I was, I had all these, because I was brought up as a son, <clears throat> sons of artists, both my mother and father were artists. <clears throat> and uh i ha i felt i was sort of uh uh i was sort of t had too many influences too many too much stuff mm. uh, it was like a kind of burden um of knowledge and influences and all that kind of thing so in about 2002 i decided just to paint rocks and the one on the lower left is an example of that of where I would find a rock, and actually, it's quite difficult to find a rock you want to paint. Um, I was, was trying; I was trying to find something with what the Chinese call key, a kind of energy. Um, and very few rocks have that, but anyway, I would. And that, in fact, I ended up after fifteen years of doing these with only about five or six rocks that 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 I felt that had this sort of um, presence, as it were. And and I would just sit in front and of these things and paint them. Um, over and over again, and then slowly they became uh, groups, uh, as the one above you can see is the one above um, of paintings um, uh, of these sort of. And you know, I was also thinking in a, at the mo at that time a lot about. I came across sort of Chinese scholar stones, uh, Chinese and Japanese scholar stones, which basically stones that were found and put onto desks and they acted as metaphors for landscapes um uh and metaphors for essences of things like monsters and things like that but within these rocks was a kind of uh, a landscape and that's what really interested me and um and that kind of sort of pulled me along um uh, for a while and i decided not to show anything for a long long time um and i was also doing other things but these were um these were uh what i was doing in terms of painting and um and then um and then that later on that evolved into caves which i'm not sure if you want to yeah so that went into the caves and uh, i had a kind of preoccupation which is which i still have which with um early homo sapien neanderthal denisovian caves uh of the birth of intelligence, the birth of perception, the birth of memory, um, and what it might have been like, um, as it were, to be uh, either sitting in a cave or standing outside one looking in, of this kind of structure that 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 uh, represented safety, warmth, um, uh, what have you, um, um, and then looking out onto the vast expanse outside mm, uh, and you know um in monomics of course uh early man developed memory by by these using paths you know to find food and shelter and uh food sources danger so on and so forth so this was a kind of starting point um uh and then of course Apart from that, there was a painting of these extraordinary structures, um, you know, cliff faces. I've always been a very, very 
influence, don't like the word influence, but I've always loved Courbet, Courbet's kind of very tactile cliff faces and um, rocks and so forth. So, um, um, and, and I suppose you could see that, you can see that, and certainly the one on the right. Um, but um, where so, are these locations, Danny? I know the names are there, but where where is? Um, yeah, they're kind of all over the place. There's, um the the one on the left is uh, a cave in Israel, where, <clears throat> um, and as <clears throat> you might know, uh, the theory uh, was that the Homo sapiens came up. Um, right. after Homo erectus, th through the Rift Valley, up through what is now Israel and uh, and that part of the world, and they inhabited these caves. And and what's extraordinary about them is that they, they inhabited them just for a, you know, a, you know, a few decades. It was like tens and tens of thousands of years. They lived in these spaces uh, and uh, without any development whatsoever. Um, hunting and making tools, and I mean, it, it took I don't know fifty thousand years for a human to go from making a tool to take flesh off the bone to it, using it as something to kill. So um, you know, intelligence was very slow in the coming. And the site on the right is in. Yeah, this is actually interesting because I I spent a lot of time in Morocco. Um, I go there a lot, I, uh, uh, and this this is a place called Irud, which is very near where I go to quite a bit. And very recently, they found some skulls there in this area, in this place. Yeah. Uh, they find some skulls which they'd originally thought were, you know, early Homo sapiens, but then it wasn't until they made they 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 uh, tested it carbon tested it and they discovered that it was a hundred thousand years earlier than the Lucy skull in the Rift Valley uh, uh, um, uh, discovered by Professor Leakey. And they always, that was always the basis for Homo sapiens coming out the Rift Valley and going and then spreading out through Europe. But in fact, this was before, which means, which is now they think that these pods of, um, of Homo sapiens actually lived all over North Africa and Africa. And developed independent to each other, yeah. um, and so and this was only fifty kilometers from where I, and I was painting these pictures, uh, and then this suddenly popped up. Are they? Do they? You work from sketches that you do in the landscape, or no, I, 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 I sort of more photographs because okay. some of these caves, particularly the Iraqi Kurdistan caves, uh, Shanindar, I mean, obviously you can't get to them accessible so okay. i take you know i find a lot of photographs and compile them and um and yeah so caves i mean obviously we could show lots of images of caves in art this yeah. is a great staffa fingal's cave which is up in the north in ireland um the giant's causeway uh yeah. the, which became part of oceanic legend um as the sort of nordic equivalent to homer uh, but i think you know in a way Turner is not really interested in this past history. That's why he throws a um, steamship in there. This was the first Turner to come to America. And, uh, you know, your stuff, as people are going to see, is, is really about this sort of vivid history of the past, um, a sense of uh, both nature and also myth uh, coming through and absent of technology, um, but really rooted in the body and in people and in, uh, you know, elements of us, whether it's bone or teeth. Here's a work called, un well, Untitled, a recent work, Oil and Canvas, which I think is, you know, sort of an encapsulation of the kind of things that, you, that you've been working with. And, and I mean, I would just say it as a sort of evolution from thinking about the rocks and thinking about the caves. And then these, these become sort of imagined uh, scenes. Mm. Yeah, this was, this is, um, yes, this is, yeah, you can see the sort of Mont Saint-Vic 12 thing in a kind of sort of the, the skin, uh, the skin of the mountain turning into these sort of um, kind of primordial facial rock type things that, that are coming out of, coming out, not just coming out of the, the rocks on the mountains, but also coming out of weather and time yeah. uh, and these sort of rather ghostly, monstrous figures um, coming forth um uh but yes i mean 
you know, a lot, a lot of these paintings, all of the paintings really, but maybe not this one in particular, come turn into sort of myth. Mm. There's a kind of mythological aspect to them, um, a sort of uh, marrying of skin and landscape and but this um this was even earlier than myth this is really the sort of formation of of humanity maybe yeah I man it's it remind me of images of the crucifixion at golgotha which means the place of the skull and where you have the skull of, of adam underneath in the ground but sort of a cutaway view below christ and the crucifix and this sort yeah. of idea that you know the, the earth is composed of us in a sense um, yeah billions and billions of you know of us from the past essentially There's yeah a few details if you want to talk about a little bit about the technique um you know I, I know you're a very deliberate painter um mm -hmm. but you know, there is a an at least a top layer here of sort of drips and yeah there's several layers and, the, and most of these paintings have because they take me actually this this painting took me relatively short Right. Of time, but the others actually sometimes take me two or three years, not because I'm continually painting on them, but they mm. evolve, you know, yeah. and so there are layers and layers and I scrub them out and put them, you know, it, it is a process. But the this one was a bit quicker and, you know, actually they they began, um, they, you know, I was sort of thinking bizarrely of, of Chardin's and Soutine's The, the Rayfish. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted that feeling of this dripping flesh um um uh, and kind of torn uh, and the 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 uh the 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 fish being open hmm. and opened up and um so i had the sense of that but that was almost too much <laughs> and yeah. uh, so they kind of sort of evolve into these rather mysterious um uh rather apt as it's halloween quite soon um uh faces looking out in both a sense kind of desperation but also kind of emerging uh out of the out of the skin sort of um and and, calc yeah, calcified like, and melting at the same time yeah and slightly comic that one on on the left with the the, the thin yeah. mouth uh, uh but uh yes um yes kind of pain um and uh surprise anxiety yeah. all the things that we are and there's and there that's the painting that it was taken from yeah this is the greatest one this is in baltimore um, yeah yeah that is a great masterpiece and yeah. so i start off with that and then it sort of emerges out of that mm -hmm. and a little bit of passage maybe in the sky in your picture but not really i, I would say I, I what i love so much about these paintings is they are uh, multivalent the the touch technique uh whatever you want to call it style um yes. it, it varies across the canvas it's you know it's not from canvas to canvas but even yeah. within the pictures and it gives you a window into uh process but also thought and also the idea of the layering of the landscape yes yeah and yeah i mean they do yeah they sort of evolve i mean i was also Thinking of Georgia O'Keeffe, as you could probably sure. know, that mountain yeah. is very Keefe. Um, and uh, so, yes, there's, uh, uh, and actually, bizarre, bizarrely, that the sky is the thing that gives me the most pain. I mean, mm. it's like, well, what is it, day, night? Uh, why should it be this at this point? And, um, and so I'm, I'm always kind of, I always struggle with that. Um, but then I, I then I thought, well, I want the, the the sense of time and weather to be dripping and the sense of kind of disappearing and evolving and this kind of a sort of almost washed out feeling. Um, and it gives the same sort of sensation that Cezanne is communicating where, you know, the brushstrokes don't vary, whether it's cloud, sky, mountain, tree, yeah. quarry. And you're getting that same kind of uh, all over all uh, over us, uh, yes, except in the mountain. Here's that, an American that's comparison. Very, that's, yeah, that's, American very, comparison. that's a very important part of the, I mean, process too, is that I do actually uh, square up the canvases and triangulate and everything, and diagonal, yeah. all that. So the actual placing of the landscape um, is is there. It's solid. Yeah. Um, uh, it doesn't go off at tangents. Yeah. I mean, I love this Marsden Hartley, obviously painted lots of yeah. pictures. 
Um, Katata and um, the simplistic of it. His element, the his solution to the sky is more like Odler than Cezanne. Yeah, with the passage in the middle ground in the the reddish hills, and then these trees in the foreground. They're sort of kind of like sentinels or or sentient human. Yes, plants. such a great. I, love it, I think. I mean, I love the and particularly the water, the seascapes and things. I think. Um, I mean, he's they're phenomenal. Um, yeah. Always good, better and better. Yeah. So the, I showed in the beginning that there are a number of portrait format pictures. Mm -hmm. um, spring on the left here. Often weather is involved. We'll see yeah. a couple winter scenes in a second. On the right, Hell Creek formation um, with these sort of pitted rocks and then uh, almost prehistoric sort of vestiges of animals and animals and craniums and teeth and whatnot, uh, as if, you know, like beasts trapped in the La Brea tar pits. But here, much softer and obviously sort of forms which feel uh, more fleshy, bodily, Caucasian, white flesh that you see here, and then these inner recesses of, of, um, of caves. But where is Hell Creek? Is that something, or is that in your head, in your mind? Well, actually this painting, um... There was two paintings before this particular. Um, this ended up like this. It's actually mm. dinosaurs, okay, uh, dinosaur yep. heads, and I've always been fascinated with the ossif ossification. So, in other words, something being ossified and turning into a, a kind of stone. Yeah. You know, not so much disintegrating, but turning into a stone. So these are kind of ossified dinosaur heads from Hell Creek formation. Which is the place in, I think, Wyoming, maybe Montana, um, uh, of uh, where they find all the the the, the huge um, dinosaur skulls, and um, so and that above it is more kind of limestone-y type, uh, sort of like a pregnant woman. Um, so it it ended up being something to do with, but sort of birth uh, evolution and. Um, all that kind of thing. Um, so, um, yeah. Um, and the one on the left um, is spring, and it's actually uh, Persephone coming out of Hades. Um, so this kind of worm-like creature coming out of Hades um, to meet Demeter. Um, she had a rough six months in the underworld. And really she rough, really rough. Yeah. You can see that. And then... These sort of um, you can see close up the sort of droplets of rain, yeah, on her body. I think that's quite a beautiful work there on the left, and it reminded me, you know, in a sense of Correggio's Jupiter and Io, which I think is one of the most beautiful paintings ever. Of course, but I haven't been to Vienna, so I haven't seen it yet. Um, yeah. It's a little hard to see, but here is Io, yet another image of Jupiter being a nasty bastard. Yeah coming up to women in various forms but he's taken the form of a cloud and here's his face and yeah. his paw that's sort of enveloping her and what she yeah incredible yeah. even in reproduction um yeah. but it feels like these are kind of channeling that but with yeah. a sense of malevolence yeah you know that, to question i guess um you know who who what artists did you sort of study under at maybe the Slade or elsewhere. I mean, it's clear, I hope to everyone that your teachers are obviously the tradition, the old masters, museums, et cetera. But are there any artists that you studied under who had a great impact on you? Not necessarily people who thought you were gonna go and paint rocks and then caves and yeah. teeth in the landscape, but you know, maybe give us a little window into that. Well, I had various teachers of the Slade and you know, the Slade at that time in the um, uh, 19, never mind, were, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of extraordinary people like Professor Lawrence Gowing, who's a great expert on Cezanne and Poussin, right. and a whole array of uh, artists, including visiting professors like uh, Lucien Freud would come in. And, um, you know, in those days, Richard Hamilton taught there, Rita Donner. And my one of my teachers is someone called Stuart Brisley, who was a performance artist. And, you know, for, you know, in a sense, you know, of course, there was all the drawing classes and all of that, which yeah. would not particularly interesting but he was fascinating and he would do things like lock himself in a kind of room with a window so you could look and you know put himself in a bath of rotting meat for 
40 days, you know. Mm -hmm. And that was really eye-opening, particularly as a kind of 17-year-old, um, that someone could put themselves through this. And there was this sort of other side of art, which I'd never really been uh, open to. And that was much more important than all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in fact, now you mentioned it, I'm looking at that Persephone penny thing. That's where it comes from. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, And he's still with us and um, he's actually a very good painter too. Um, uh, but you know that was a, that was an important thing, um, and you know you didn't you always took it for granted back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, these people were teaching. Um, uh, so Freud would come in and give a class. I mean, did he do critique crits? Did not he? Freud, not really. He was really yeah. he would come in once or twice a term to see who he could pick up, uh, right. which which. Uh, yeah, um, but he 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 would just his presence was quite you know both alarming and uh, yeah informative. I mean he was um, he Did was, you have a sense of him being a sort of titanic figure and that no because in those days yeah. um, he wasn't you right. know I remember going to the Anthony Doffe show and uh, half of the show was unsold so yeah. he was of course in the art world he was very an important figure but he wasn't outside of it particularly yeah. you know the art world in those days was mu much smaller than it is now yeah and uh, also london you know i have the impression that painting was not really the thing i mean at least when you got into the late 80s early 90s so, so many right. artists like cecily brown and nicola tyson came to america to paint because it wasn't happening in in london yeah well it's true and you know painting people are our back and freud and so on were thought of as provincial artists, you right. know, yeah, by yeah. Uh, by the great intellectual um, uh, uh, people of the day. I mean, not people, but uh, conceptual artists. Yeah. And uh, and so uh, and but um, of course they doggedly went on and on and and um, and of course we see them in a different light. But there was a moment, a time, when it wasn't so. Hmm. Hmm. So here's a couple more of these uh, upright pictures laid uh, on the left, um, which is maybe the most explicit work uh, in terms of reference. There's Zeus uh, as a swan um, coming onto uh, the pulsing body of Leda as I read it. And on the right is Andromeda chained to the rock, but similar to the image of spring, which we just showed, but now in a different in a different season. Um, sort of working within these almost like series paintings in a sense, uh, loosely or maybe uh, more directly related to mythology. Mm. Yes, I mean they're to, they're both uh, the the leader one was um, I think one of the only one in the in the um, show where I had an idea of leader uh, yeah. before even starting the painting. Andromeda quite the reverse. I was thinking, what the hell is this about <laughs> i was painting it and then i thought oh well of course it's come it's 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 coming it's this sort of an andromeda feeling of this kind of iced hmm. uh, queen as it were not much sure was a queen but sort of uh, uh ice to the <clears throat> ice to the uh to the rock surface um this kind of iced vanity iced hubris um and, waiting for a hero and leader over there is you know, it's more sort of literal in the sense and that she's, you know, that uh, the open, the open stone with the, the fruit and the, the oozing, actually that, that came from a sort of painting, I think, by Manet. Mm. It's kind of oozing uh, cut fruit. Um, and then the snow, again, weather is important um, because of the passing of time and um and particularly with snow there's a kind of softness to it yeah. um and it makes it sort of celestial yeah yeah it's 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 highlights and i think of you know critics used to deride constable as painting with snow constable snow which he used to give highlights in in nature but yeah this also becomes something uh, sort of about the universe i think yeah. there's a lot of that that i which we saw earlier looking out from the cave into the great unknown i mean what the heck did uh, early Homo sapiens think about the star, the stars. Excuse me, oh. that kind of idea where they use myth to try to understand it. Yeah, where's the snowplow? Yeah, cracking, cracking from <laughs> twenty twenty. Looking by the way, 
you know, I love all the Peter Doig mm. of Architects House, I think it's called. Yeah. Um, I love the way he makes snow. And um, uh, so that sort of played a part in it, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, this one has a, a extraordinary composition and a sort of flow, these sort of crags at the top, glowing uh, celestial nocturnal sky above yeah. the the octopus pods um suckers the, the, the there's a lot of amazing eyes in these paintings this sort of one eye um yeah. looking out maybe accusatorily um and, and the extraordinary painting of the the cliffs can we go to that for a second uh, a lot of facture um in this and uh build up of paint and impasto and this is what I was sort of alluding to before, that dichotomy between the smoothness of the surfaces, which read as skin slash limestone, uh, the glossiness of the um, cephalopod, the uh, octopus or squid or whatnot, and then the rocks, which are, mm. which are even more alive in a way. Yeah. Well, so using, What are you using to paint these? Well, I'm using oil, um, but mm. there's a lot of palette knife going on and also the sand at the bottom i use, i quite often incorporate sand into the paint mm -hmm. to get that kind of texture roughness um I, I you know I, I love the kind of uh duality of having this kind of soft skin mm -hmm. and then the harshness of the rock there's a kind of um sense that one goes into the other one is formed by the other one disintegrates into the other and mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> in this particular painting you know, the stars and the kind of brain of the octopus somehow have a connection that there's a sort of mm. celestial um, sense of this octopus uh, penetrating Gaia. Um, uh, also, you know, there was, <laughs> bizarrely, there's another story to this where, where an old friend who is sadly no longer with us, Duncan Hanna, wrote mm. his autobiography, where he describes going, being on LSD and going to the forest and digging a hole in the ground and and fucking the hole. Mm -hmm. I just love that image. I just thought this is whole, you know, this this is a metaphor for for humanity. <laughs> and uh, so I had this idea, and this of course this comes from a, a Bibbermas quarry, I think it's in the National Gallery, um, with a huge quarry, the face of the quarry, and then the and the landscape below. Right. And so this this downward pull into the into the into the earth um, with a sky above. Uh, Duncan Hanna's autobiography is called Twentieth Century Boy. And Twentieth Century Boy, I highly recommend it. Good read. Um, yeah. He was a great. He was a great man. I had him in a show once at uh, Olana and Cedar Grove in 2015. Uh, the comparison with Corbet, I, I think, is evident. Um, the yes. origin. And you know, but the origin of world also came out of paintings like that you alluded to before um, that Corbet did in Ornal of the origin of the Lou, the river that ran through the valley where he grew up, and yeah. then painted this picture for a Turkish diplomat with pornographic taste. But I remember when this this painting was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in its Corbet show, and they had it like in a side room with a trigger warning on the outside for people before they went in that you you know warned, there's explicit imagery in here and then you went in to look at it and self-consciousness of getting in front of this picture to find that actually of all of Corbet's work and I'm not a huge Corbet fan because I'm a pre-Raphaelite team guy um it this is the most sort of uh carefully painted the most uh sort of I, I don't know in terms of brushwork brushstroke etc almost like he wants you to get in close to it and look at it. Um, and the Kraken on the left is something that you just seem scary, you seem frightening. Yes. Mm. Yes. I sort of, well, they're, they're both very sensuous. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't really thinking of that, but once, when it, as so often that happens, you know, you suddenly an image comes up and, uh, and you say, yeah, that's the, the Eureka moment. Yes. That's what I was trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> and uh working yeah and uh no but you know um uh it's strange i always with 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 a uh, corbe you know i remember looking at corbe when i was 10 or 11 and, mm. uh, and being sort of bowled over by it uh there's a kind of a, uh immediacy to it to him and to his work you know it's there it's present and uh it's it's really 
it's in your face in, in a way that very few painters um accomplish you know yeah. uh, um or, that time. Uh, you know it really is a, it, it's visceral yeah here's a uh, gaia which i think you mentioned before yeah for me is the creepiest with these these eyes in yes poking out it's a it's a guy the story of uh the chaos what's rather extraordinary about greek mythology is how closely linked it is to the truth but mm. chaos uh uh guy was formed in order to make earth and then uranus was sent down to form gaia into what we now know as the earth and uh then they couple and uh the one of the products of that was the cycle three cyclopses uh, mm. and uranus so horrified by this uh, these children uh, of his threw them back into Gaia, giving her great pain, oh. and which would eventually cause his demise. But um, uh, so you have these eyes poking out, poking out the what is was the Mont Saint Victoire, and uh, these kind of breasts and skin that, um, mm. and the volcano, this kind of angry volcano, yeah. uh, they're trapped, in there, trapped in the earth. Yeah. So that one and the other one, uh, uh, Quarry, were the first two that kind of, you know, of the of this series. Um, this one has a particularly very beautiful sky, which I tried to take details of, but I couldn't get the color right with that. Yeah. No, it's very difficult to reproduce. It's a sort of indigo blue powder yeah. paint that you mix with with paint, and then when you paint it, the the oil of the the reflection comes out but it is very um you have to be quite careful with it because uh, it comes off in, with your finger but you have this depth that you can't yeah. really get with all with yeah, it's really beautiful and and the yeah. iphone can't, cannot handle it cannot handle it you stump the iphone that should be the goal of all artists <laughs> i also love i also love the sort of baroque intensity of a lot of these works mm. uh one of my favorite uh, series of works is the uh the sculptures from the uh the uh, great altar at pergamon and there's an incredible image of gaia coming out of the ground to try to save her son alcione alcionios those are hellenistic sculptures from uh the second century a, a bce and this yeah. has you know baroque flow and quality of drama and lighting and uh mm -hmm. and that that sort of powerful sort of musculation and power that you see yeah. in these works um just to throw in another pre-Raphaelite work, um, which I think kind of relates to the elements that you're thinking about. This is one of the great paintings, I think, of limestone. This is by William Dice, Pegwell Bay, Kent, a recollection of October 5th, 1858, which is at Tate with this image of Halley's Comet streaking here across the sky at the top. So it's about um, universal time and and uh, un uh, the time in the uh, time in the celestial sense, mm -hmm. and then it's also about human time and endeavor with the cliffs. Um, the view of sunset here, uh, the women who are collecting shells, uh, the men who are uh, the other people who are collecting clams in the distance. A figure here in the pose of the Doriferous, uh, great sculpture by Polycletus, and the young kid is looking off. Uh, off camera, so to speak, um, into the future. But these sort of images, which, you know, obviously in the 19th century, they're more cloaked by figuration and a kind of narrative. Um, and yet they are channeling the same kind of ideas, the history of a place, um, the concept of celestial time and diurnal time day, of, of a single day and people uh, in, in their midst. So I think there's a, there's a beautiful continuity between you know, not just the old master stuff that we've been talking about, but also 19th century works, which relate to these. Absolutely. And, and you know, what, what you know, I don't actually know this painting, but it, I mean, it very much relates to another preoccupation of mine, which is the sublime. Mm. Uh, and <clears throat> so, you know, um, starting off with Friedrich um, uh, and going on, uh, you showed a Turner before. Yeah. But that's a very important aspect, um, you know, this kind of... Uh, overwhelming sensation of 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 nature and and uh of things that one can't quite grasp yeah um uh, uh that's that's kind of you know and i'm glad you showed that painting because that's that's very indicative of of mm. uh, these paintings 
and something yeah. a little bit that's been lost in in painting. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of narrative in painting, but there's not that much sort of atmospheric narrative. Right. Yeah. I mean, the sublime and Robert Rosenblum isolated that in some works in the mid 20th century and uh, yeah. Clifford Still and, and Rothko. Uh, yeah. But of course, they're absent of figuration. You're sort of reintroducing it into these pictures and the idea of, you know, human time is so short and small compared to the iron oh. This one, charge. I don't know what to say about it. it. It's it's a madcap picture, which is delightful with these sort of pig-like forms slash horse with some rocks in the foreground. Um, lots of eyes trapped in the lattice work of the uh, uh, calcium-based material here. Some horns, uh, a cave. Mm. Yeah. But I did think of, it did make me think of the sublime and these yeah. ideas of paintings like George Stubbs, Horse Frightened by a Lion, where a lion is sort of lurking in a cave and waiting yeah. for a brilliant white stallion to come out um, in order to attack it, which itself is based on famous Roman sculpture at the Capitoline Museums um, of yeah. a lion attacking a horse. I was looking a lot at, at that kind of type of painting, and you know, a particular favorite of mine is, as you know, is James Ward. Yeah. Uh, these kind That's of well, very yeah. ferocious animals, uh, and uh, Cordell Scar, that one right at the table, exactly, yeah, yeah, with with the, the the bulls fighting at the base of it. It's yeah. vast painting, and in a sense, in in, in you know, charge in charge, I had that um, idea of of this the, these two animal forms. Mm -hmm. I don't know what they are, but they're yeah. kind of animals, human forms charging and it became a sort of idea of lust and vanity of human lust and human vanity mm. um and you know there's kind of almost sur um plastic surgery lips on the left with the mm -hmm. uh, actually the uh, bottom uh that yeah that mm -hmm. and uh and uh and and uh, it's kind of a metaphor an analogy of humankind yeah destroying itself with nature behind with these eyes coming out of the rock face looking on and um and oh, horror. base <laughs> instincts base instincts yeah exactly basic instincts mm. uh, I mean, the, the paintings are wonderful really people should go see them just yeah. to, they're there i call it aerobic art history where you got to move back and then go forward and go back to see yeah. them properly um and in and in their vastness and also in the in the intricate yeah the sky in this one is particularly wonderful beautiful and you know with a little bit of that passage but also this sort of iridescent blue um color which reminds me of Gorchino, you know the the samson at the met it's a similar tone and also yeah. at the met of course el greco's view of toledo which and that's what that's exactly what i was sort of thinking about when i was painting that sky I had terrific problems with that sky. It was blue, it was gray, it was black, it was everything. And then it occurred to me that there was this, uh, <clears throat> um, this these El Grecos, these these uh, images of the sky are so extraordinary and uh, uh, they're animate. They're animate. I mean, they're yeah, yeah. They're a character, right? Yes. Yeah, um, they're a character, and I try to in this painting. Everything is sort of uh goes into the the sky goes into the rock the rock goes into the sand so there's a kind of unity yeah. in in all the forms uh and the materials mm, they blend beautifully together yeah. and the el greco starts it all and, and when we talk about landscape in yes tradition this this portrait format but you know something which goes on and on and on into the heavens yeah um, one last work uh, from the present show. I think we've covered them all. This is called The Hunt. And this one, uh, oil on canvas, but there is some mixed media involved in this picture, in this section here. Yes. Awesome. Antlers painted. Um, and yeah, I wanted to tell people what, what is. Well, you know, it is it is a painting. It is turned out to be, it's actually from a Cezanne watercolor. Um but this turned into a story of action and diner. Mm -hmm. uh, I call it the hunt. And it's really the first me too story, if you will, where act, action who's going out hunting 
uh, comes across Diana. She's so infuriated that she turns him into a stag, so his own hounds kill him, tear him apart. <laughs> and so you do have a... Um, uh, you have that the the first Me Too uh, story there, and and then I was in rather in two minds about the teeth. The teeth are actually coyote teeth. These uh, are, uh, yeah, attached to the surface. Bad. But I I was a bit worried. I was like, is this too literal? You know, in two minds. But um, yes, it's sort of this teeth um, uh, gnawing into the into actium. Where do you get where do you get coyote teeth? Uh, eBay. Asking for a friend. I'm just asking for a friend. Yeah, yeah. you just get it on eBay. Okay. Everything. <laughs> Easily. Probably get, of, probably get one of these on eBay soon. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have that, you know, you have the the it's a collage essentially with the teeth. But then this extraordinary trompe l'oeil painting of the of the um antlers, which you see here. Yeah. And then uh, you know, sort of exploding there in the center. And uh, Diana or whomever and her attendants gathered around and then this craggy form above, yes. above there. Um, we also talked a little bit about the impact of Francis Bacon yes. work and um, this one of his early pictures uh, here with, with teeth, avec teeth. Uh, here yes. they are. Um, yeah, yes. What, what was your experience with him as a, as a young artist? I think Bacon, I mean, in this show particularly, I mean, certainly, I mean, what, Interests. I mean, many things interest me about Bacon, but uh, <clears throat> primarily um, uh, the way that he uh, uh, composed his pictures, in the sense that there's always this sense that he's painting a sculpture of a um, of a picture. So it's that every every subject is on a kind of pedestal. Well, this is a literal one. He is on a pedestal. This the yeah. creature is on a pedestal, but all the paintings have this kind of uh, Velasquez type of um, structure where you're looking uh, down or across or into um, the subject, whether it be a kind of screaming pope or a businessman, or whatever. Um, and uh, I remember reading somewhere. Um, I think David Sylvester talking about how Bacon got everything from Henry Moore, which, by the way, is another great influence on on, on these paintings. Um, mm. And I'll Stop. tell you a little later. But uh, uh, the, the, that, uh, you know, he got that there is this, you know, this object uh, presented. And so all the vertical paintings in the show have that kind of sense, you know, the crack and the Hell Creek formation and the others have this, you know, thing of looking into um, the subject matter um, uh, as an object. Um, Henry Moore um, is a wonderful example, rather like scholar stones, is that they're kind of these rounded shapes, yeah. smooth, uh, rounded figures, uh, uh, really landscapes, they're mountains uh, with the, the, you know, Mother Earth car. Mountains and bodies. Yeah, and um, like Degas monoprints that he does late in life, but oh, really marvelous. Yeah, yeah, and bodies at, at one. I mean, the Bacon thing is is really interesting. He does present these forms to you. Sometimes you're looking down at them, sort of from above, and yeah. then he frames it right. He frames every picture with the gold frames. I, it struck me at the retrospective at the Met many moons yeah. ago. These gold frames, and then the insistence on glazing them. Right, everything has to be under glass so that yeah. you. Can help but see yourself reflected in every single picture he's sort of casting that, them yes. ourselves yeah and it served as a kind of breaking you know a sort of again it's like looking into something looking right. through a window into something yeah uh and i think that was something that he was very uh keen on um and and i'm framing is underrated these days no one frames but you know i'd, I'd quite like to frame these yeah, they look great. Yeah. I think also Bacon, you can even tell from these details, is similarly had a, a, a real variance of touch across his compositions. They were yeah. not consistently painted, you know, in the same oh, way. I mean, by the way, some of them are terrible. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Really, he painted a lot. <laughs> he, yeah. You know, uh, he did, and he threw away a tremendous amount. It was all, you know, this brush stroke. Um, 
these automatic brush strokes and then created a lot of problems or you know meant that he made a lot of mistakes and had to throw a lot of a lot of paintings away just here just showing you the titians which are shared now by the national gallery in london the national yeah. gallery of scotland the great huge duke of sutherland pictures diana and actian there yeah. she's she's sort of surprised by him yes he didn't mean to stumble upon her it just happened no. um the dog is 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 livid and yeah. then in the that final, one, that's the that's the one that i was really kind of looking at the, the tone lot. of the landscape the yeah. the combination of the coloration here the movement and the movement is it's fantastic yes. yeah only one titian yeah caves yeah. i just want to share with you my favorite cave um, and that the caves and the grottos and the earth and the limestone are so much a part of our sort of shared Western idea of the imagination. Of course, it's not limited to the West, I should say. But in this case, this is the incredible grotto of Tiberius at Sperlonga, which is south of Rome along the coast um, near Geta, uh, which was Tiberius's villa down the hill. You went down and then there was this incredible cave where they had built this whole system of canals to let the seawater in and you would get in a boat and be tooled around inside the cave at night. And the cave had uh, human carved out grottos and in each of the grotto in the cave were tableaus with sculpture. It was a bit like It's a Small World in, in Walt Disney World where you get in a boat and you see all these tableaus. And one was like the blinding of Polyphemus. Uh, these are Hellenistic works again. And these figures are larger than life. These figures, okay. this one is, 15 feet long it's insane uh these sculptures which were in these grottos but you know clearly in the roman empire early empire they were obsessed with the same things the earth this is where the myth comes from um the way that stories play out across the landscape across the mediterranean which is so special to you um and then you know bringing them sort of vividly into the present and i i, I think that's you know something that's really happening in in this exhibition uh, with these paintings. So kudos to you. Um, congratulations on, on a really thoughtful and thought provoking um, show. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to show you people a little bit more of the many hats that Danny Moynihan wears. Uh, he has for a long time been a curator. This was a show that he curated at Nino Meyer Gallery um, la uh, 2023 over the summer. It was called Beach. Um, I reviewed it for the Brooklyn Rail. Uh, terrific show of contemporary artists and some old masters here and there, um, modernist masters with uh, scenes of the ocean uh, and some one sculpture um, in two locations. But right now you can go see a show that he has curated at Lyles and King in Chinatown. Uh, Lindsay Adario's extraordinary photographs, it's called Raw, uh, where she has, she's a, She's a photographer. She works for major, major media outlets, but she is also someone who has made her living in war zones. And these extraordinary pictures that she's taken all over the world, she's been embedded in Ukraine for years now, feels, and uh, Danny's hung it in a, a really extraordinary way in these bright white galleries. And with the feeling for landscape um, in this particular wall, which is my favorite, in the installation um so just a plug people should go see Lindsay's show what did i say it's up through november 9th november 9th so go vote and then go check out uh lindsey adaria's works um terrific uh and also you know i, I don't want to make the, there's any affinity but there's a reason you were attracted to this stuff right what what, what would you say it is and in, in a line or well, two the, with Lindsay's, i mean i've always been rather fascinated well with photography in general but mm -hmm. particularly with war photography, which um, I think is an extraordinary uh, uh, medium because it's um, it's uh, you know when you are when you're taking a photograph, if you're Ansel Adams, you're taking a photograph, you're composing a photograph, you're taking a photograph. Uh, but in these conditions, um, the condition in war conditions, you have no time to start thinking. Yeah composition or anything like that you're really shooting from the hip so um uh in fact there's a there's a wonderful um uh interview between bacon and sylvester in which um uh bacon is describing the way he paints the methodology of 
this kind of automatism, as it were, of, of mm. brushstrokes. And um, and then uh, Sylvester says, you mean it's rather like returning a ping pong at high speed, uh, meaning that you don't have any really, you have a kind of subconscious uh, reaction to where and how you should respond uh, to this fast-moving object. And um, it seemed to me with war photography that you have the that idea, that possibility of of just taking that photograph, that image and that split second under huge, incredible pressure. So even though a lot of these photographs are not under huge pressure, they have that same feeling of shooting from the hip and yeah. just getting that image yes. a split second. Yeah. So, um, you know, that is why um, I did that exhibition. She's an extraordinary photographer. Uh, you can still go and see the show before yeah. it comes. Check it out. Yeah. Check it out. So thank you so much for this conversation today. Here's a little view of the studio where the magic happens. Um, and uh, we're going to, I don't know, should I turn it over to Chloe? I'm turning it over to Chloe, but we're going to end as we usually do with a poem. But in this case, Danny's going to read to us. So go ahead, Chloe, and I'll keep the screen up. Yeah, I've got two questions from the audience, but before I ask them, thank you, Danny and Jason, for this conversation today. Um, the first question is going to be from GE. GE is wondering if, similar to an Auden's poem, how limestone erodes to create from both familiar and alien, is your art aiming to blur boundaries, challenging us to question what is solid, our sense of mutability, and our memory? Yes, I mean, I think um, uh, that's a very, it's a very good question because that's really sort of the crux of of the work is that you know, the, this sense of uh, decay and uh, and then regeneration, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, I see nature as very much kind of living form, something that is conscious, not just sitting there. Um, uh, surrounding us, but something which is actually a living thing, living with us. Um, uh, um, but so that's a, that's a very important thing. I think we are integral to it uh, and part of it. And um, so, yeah, that's that's um, that's important. Yeah. Thank you, Danny. Um, and the last question today is going to be from Fong. Fong, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank oh, you, Jason. Thank you. What a lovely conversation. I can't wait to see the show. Um, oh. Yeah, can't wait. I'm sorry I missed the opening, but I'm coming hopefully tomorrow or Friday. But sure. I, um, yeah, I have two questions, Danny. You guys already spoke great deal about your early formation and the school, all these marvelous professors and artists that you came in contact with. But I, I meant to ask a very kind of related to your father, who I met in '86. I think when he had a show at Robert Miller, yes. and George introduced me to your father, which by that time I already read a great deal about the great experimental school, the Houston Road School that was yeah. created in, I think it's only lasted for two years, 37, 39 maybe. Yeah. So during the crucial years of the London School, you know, yeah. and was created by, of course, um, Richard Passmore, Claude Roger, and William Coldstream, and your father taught there. And I love that school so much because it were committed to teach abstraction and representation works simultaneously. Yes. Never yeah. been done before. So that's the question whether since you grew up with your father being a great artist, uh, whether that philosopher school have any early effect on your and your thinking from the get goes, and then I will say to the second soon. That I mean, uh, the way of the Euston Road painters because they were all Adrian Stokes and 
Coldstream Passmore, not so much my father, uh, had this kind of rather sort of misty way of painting, uh, kind of almost impressionistic. Um, but in terms of my father and the Euston Road, my father was between 1933 and 1936-7. He made these paintings uh, called objective abstractions, and they were kind of overall abstract paintings, um, uh, mm. kind of influenced by Monet's uh, water lilies, uh, as if you were kind of looking very intently at a certain part of a Monet painting, or as the poet David Gascoigne described an explosion in a jam factory mm. uh, and and so he had in his very early 20s this, you know it was almost like the first abstract painter in in britain um uh, who would do who's doing these this kind of abstraction not yeah. not formal abstraction but more um uh, uh i don't know by what would you call it bio abstraction yeah. and, uh, um so yes, I mean, I think particularly those paintings very with a very kind of abstract uh, uh, surface, um, coarse gray. They were kind of gray white. Uh, I suppose we could say that uh, I was in a, in a you know in a way influenced by them, and that I was they were there when I was growing up. Hmm. Yeah. Um, what about art painter like Sam? You know Graham Sutherland. Yeah, well, Graham Sutherland. Um, I mean, I I like early Graham Sutherland, a sort of British post surrealism, what whatever you call it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think um, I'm I'm not uh, too interested in the later ones, uh, yeah. but uh, the early ones are those extraordinary landscapes with with the bizarre shaped stones. But they were <clears throat> uh, they're they're really. I mean, I try not to make something of my my landscapes. They're very much what you know. They're very much to do with the rock. They're not. They're yeah. not kind of curious surrealistic shapes. I mean, I try and avoid all of that type of thing. It's so like closer to John or Paul Nash, I think, in in a way. Yeah, yeah. Although you know, I, I might have an English accent. I don't think of myself as particularly. Yeah. You know, no, I mean, I don't, I don't either. But I mean, yeah. <laughs> the strain of the, the you know, yeah. conversation. I've never you actually, been, been, I've never been totally in love with Nash. Uh, yeah, really interesting. But, uh, but uh, you were a war yeah. artist, also more earthy. I'm more earthy. Yeah. Uh, okay, so oh, this, do you is, think? Do, this do you is a, a far off question in a way, but I remember talking to actually Lauren Gowan. All right. Uh, yeah, you know, we attended to one of his lecture um, right after the great show at uh, the National Gallery of Art in D.C. when he curated that amazing early Cezanne show mm -hmm. in the fall or winter of 89, I remember, because I took the bus down to see it from yes. college. But I, um, I wanted to ask, because of his reference declaring that Van Gogh late Van Gogh saying that it would have been the first, you know, artist who really could be equivalent of an Asian Chinese landscape painter, you know, because the treatment of the all over yes. weight of things in the cosmic sense of things, I guess would be the term cosmic totality. Yes. Uh, so I, I, I wonder if, you ever thought about Chinese landscapes painting at all? Absolutely. I mean, I particularly very much. Um, and um, uh, I do actually have some Chinese Japanese scrolls. Um, and uh, yes, the, that kind of brushwork and the immediacy of, of, uh, of, of landscape um, painting, uh, Chinese landscape painting, uh um was has always fascinated me uh, mm. and and japanese print you know block painting those uh with those extraordinary which of course van gogh was very influenced by or must have been influenced by those deep blues and, oh absolutely uh, and uh all of that so uh two completely different types of of uh working the, the block and the and the scrolls but the scrolls particularly and people like seshu the 16th century 
uh, uh, Japanese artists who are literally just one brush stroke to mm -hmm. note one leaf or branch or whatever, but with such accuracy and, and simplicity. Um, uh, I mean, we're I mean way ahead of their time in a sense. Uh, yeah. Um, and I was uh, yeah, I love that, and I have a beautiful one of a of a waterfall, very long, just the water at the top just falling, this just black and white ink mm. drawing from seventeen eighty. Yeah. Uh, um, so yes, I mean, I'm glad you you pointed that out because we haven't talked about it, but that is very much um, very much part of the my vocabulary. Well, that's terrific because I know that he made that connection between Van Gogh. Yeah. You know, maybe Sung Dynasty, great master, all the way to Pollock. So there's somewhere in that lineage that I'm trying to figure out where does <laughs> where does your, your painting then it fit in. Anyway, yeah. I love the use of tonality in the works and the physicalness of the paint application. So I'm dying to see the show as soon as I, I can get there. But for 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 the time being. Sending a, a huge congratulations. Thank you, Fong. Uh, thank you for coming on to our NSD, you know. Thank you, Jason, also. Back to you, Chloe. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Fong. Thanks, Fong. Um, thanks again to Jason and Danny. And now, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Danny to read us a poem to close us out okay. today. Well, this isn't praise of limestone, but I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's very long. So um, I've... I've uh, I've uh, put it, cut it into four little sections, uh, and uh, which I'll read now, um, uh, in praise of limestone. If it form the one landscape that we, the inconstant ones, are consistently homesick for, this is chiefly because it dissolves in water. Mark these rounded slopes with their surface fragrance of time and, and beneath a secret system of caves and conduits, Hear the springs that spurt out everywhere with a chuckle, each filling a private pool for its fish and carving, its own little ravine whose cliffs, whose cliffs entertain the butterfly and the lizard. Examine this region of short distances and definite places. What could be more like mother or a fitter background for her son, the flirtatious male who lounges against a rock in the sunlight, never doubting? So that's the first little bit. Second is about 20 lines uh, along. Unable to conceive a God whose temper tantrums are moral and not to be pacified by a clever line or a good lay. For accustomed to a stone that responds, they have never had to veil their faces in awe of a crater whose blazing fury could not be fixed. Adjusted to the local needs of valleys where everything can be touched or reached by walking. Their eyes have never looked into infinite space through the lattice works of a nomad's comb. Born lucky, their legs have never encountered the fungi and insects of the jungle, the monstrous forms and lies with which we have nothing. We like to hope in common. Third section. This land is not the sweet home that it looks, nor its peace the historical calm of a site where something was settled once and for all. A black wand and a dilapidated province, connected to the big busy world by a tunnel with a certain seedy appeal. Is that all there is now? Not quite. It has a worldly duty which in, in spite of itself it does not neglect but calls into question all the great powers assume. It disturbs our rights. And the final bit, which is the end. <clears throat> in so far as we have to look forward to death as a fact, no doubt we are right. But if sins can be forgiven, if bodies rise from the dead, these modifications of matter into innocent athletes and gesticulating fountains, made solely for pleasure, make a further point. The blessed will not care what angle they are regarded from, having nothing to hide. Dear, I know nothing of either, but when I try to imagine a faultless love or the life to come, what I hear is the murmur of underground streams. What I see 
is a limestone landscape. There we go. Thank you for closing us out with that reading, Danny. And thank you to you and Jason again for today's conversation. Thank you as well to the Terra Foundation for American Art, who sponsor our new social environment program and make daily conversations like this one possible. These conversations are also available in our archive, which is on YouTube. Um, the rail has been free and independent for 24 years in celebration of our anniversary. We've just launched a new website, which I encourage you all to go check out. We're also seeking to raise $200,000 by the end of this year. Please consider donating to the rail to directly support our staff, our writers, and our operations. You can support our work through the link in the chat. And if you're free tomorrow at 1 p.m., join us for a conversation with Joel Sternfeld and Jeffrey Batchen on the occasion of American Prospects at the Bruce Museum. And as is real tradition, you all can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you, Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. We really like you, Jason. Congratulations. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Danny. 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 Thank you,